You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. So here we are in Phuket, Thailand, and I am so lucky to be here with the Dallies. This is John and Jill Dally, and they are the originators or the founders of Soy Dog. Am I correct on that? Yep. yep. The, uh, with a, another lady, we started it in 2003. Well, it's been really amazing. I just took an amazing tour of this facility, and I cannot believe what I have seen. I mean, this would put many shelters to shame you know, across America and mean that, boy, wouldn't they be so envious to have the facilities. But the amount of dogs that you are treating here is just mind-boggling in my mind. I cannot believe the facilities and what you're building. I mean, you're, 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 you're doing better things and better things all the time. You're saving, how many dogs are you saving a year? Oh, well, last year we were sterilizing 30,000 and we're treating around 100 a week here. So probably around about 5,000 are being treated every year. 5,000 dogs. Mm. Truly amazing. I will also ask you, tell me a little bit how you guys got started on this. I, I, I heard you came here for some retirement or something? <laughs> yeah. A um, bit of a standing joke. To, uh, we came here to retire and something went wrong. But I was fortunate to be able to take early retirement at a relatively early age, in my early 50s. We'd been coming here for a few years on holiday. In fact, we got married here. 19 years ago, I better get that right, haven't I? <laughs> and so we decided, yeah, we'd like to, to move here, but also wanted, because relatively young, to not just spend our days laying on the beach, which gets pretty boring after a while, but to try and put something back into the, into the community that we were now calling home. We'd, be, we'd seen over the years the, the stray dog problem, which was horrendous at the time. Literally, you couldn't go down any street or corner without coming across many dogs emaciated starving most of them hairless covered in sores and the problem was clearly getting out of control so i determined right i would look see what could be done about this i mean neither of us have any background in animal welfare at all jill initially was going to look at uh, teaching underprivileged kids english but there were a lot of people doing that and it wasn't so easy to get involved with being retired so she joined as well. I met this Dutch lady who had also just retired to Phuket, and she was a great believer. She'd been doing it in Bangkok in the, her own neighbourhood for the previous year of sterilisation being the main, the most effective tool, and that's really how it started. So it started with sterilisation, but now you've gone much farther than that. I mean, you're dealing with dogs that are going into the meat trade, correct? John, isn't that something that you, you focus a lot on? I know that's a lot of what I hear about soy dog um, in, in the news. Yeah, I first, I mean, we did a this film being made actually called The Shadow Trade. And it's well titled because a lot of people, including myself, were totally unaware that there was a dog meat industry going on in Thailand. And it wasn't until oh, about 2009 when I saw a newspaper photo of a truck loaded with oh, well over a thousand dogs in a newspaper photographed in Laos. That this was a dog, truck of Thai dogs on the way to Vietnam. And I started to look into it and found out just how big an issue it was and how many dogs were involved. At that time, the Thai Veterinary Association estimated half a million dogs a year going from Thailand to Vietnam alone. Half a million dogs a year being used for meat purposes. To Vietnam, and that doesn't include the ones being killed locally for their skins and for local meat oh. consumption. So I literally focused, every, contacted every big charity I could think of. We were still a small charity in those days. And, but nobody was really interested in it. So I, I made a promise to myself at that time that as soon as I th we could do something concrete about it, that I wanted to do this because I said to myself at the time, if there's one thing I can achieve before I die is to see an end to this. Because people think that, okay, it's a cultural issue, you know, Asians eat dogs just as Westerners eat beef or pork. What people aren't aware of is the horrendous cruelty involved in this business, literally from the moment the dogs are picked up 
to their end and it's horrendous you know we were just talking a little bit earlier when we were looking at the dogs from the meat trade that you had been saved that have been saved and and all been adopted that, down there that we had seen that um, there's this common belief in different cultures that if you beat the dogs when they're alive that they're more tender is that right and there's there's what, what are the beliefs that some of these cultures have there's a lot of different beliefs I mean that's not universal but certainly in some areas yeah they believe that if you the more pain the dog undergoes before death that that increases the adrenaline and that improves the flavor of the meat and that is practiced in some areas other areas though it's quite literally it's almost as though they don't understand that the the suffering these dogs are going through it's quite very common to skin dogs alive to throw them into pots of boiling water puppy eye photos of puppies that have been just thrown into a pot still alive and it's this type of thing that is is the heart of the why I want to stop it but the beliefs are you know it's not cultural at all I mean a lot of these countries it's 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 a growing business and it's based on false claims that for example dog meat as a as a film coming out shortly in called dog it's called sorry eating happiness and a lot of Chinese believe that by eating dog it will make you happy because dogs are happy. are happy in Vietnam the peak season for eating dogs it, it ties in with lunar cycles so at the end of a lunar cycle it's lucky to eat dogs but at the beginning it's bad luck and the peak time is in the winter because they believe that dog meat has warming properties yet in Korea the peak time is in the summer which is now now because they believe it has cooling properties the mo- you know, the majority of dog meat is eaten by men who will drink it at parties with beer. They believe it has aphrodisiac properties. In certain cultures, certain uh, in Cambodia particularly, uh, black dogs are considered to be uh, have more aphrodisiac properties. You know, they're going to make you powerful, strong, etc. Wow. All of this is nonsense. And the reality is, eating dog is dangerous. Nowhere, in no country is it considered livestock, and there are no regulations governing it. So even in Asian countries, there will be regulations and inspections of meat for it's classified as livestock, beef, pork, chicken, etc. But dog meat doesn't fall under that, so there are no regulations covering it. We know large numbers of these dogs, or not large numbers, but a percentage of these dogs are carrying rabies. Now, if a dog is cooked properly, you cannot transmit rabies, but dogs carry a lot of zoonotic diseases that can be passed to humans. There's been documented outbreaks of cholera in Vietnam through eating dog meat tray. It's actually not a healthy meat to eat, as a lot of people uh, here believe it is. I, I you also have to remember as well, a lot of people think that these people eat dog meat because they've got nothing else to eat or they can't afford something else. Uh, whereas the fact is that dog meat is a luxury meat. It costs three to four times more than a piece of chicken or a piece of pork would. So it is a treat, and that's how it's seen as something to celebrate. If you've got a birthday party or you want to treat your long-lost friend that's come back to see you, you take them out for the best thing that's available, and that is dog meat. Oh, it's amazing. Well, we're going to be right back after a few words from our sponsors. John and Jill, it's wonderful to be here with you, and uh, we'll be right back. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations and treat bowls, cups and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash pet life. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. (laughs) 
This is Chris Ante Canine Master, and welcome back to the Soy Dog Foundation in Thailand in Phuket. I am so lucky to be here with John and Jill Daly from Phuket, who started the Soy Dog Foundation. John, let me ask you another question: it, Is it illegal to sell dog uh, tr- the dog meat trade in Thailand? Is that legal? As from the end of December last year, it is now illegal to eat animals that are not considered. Livestock or normal, normal animals that would be eaten in society. So that includes dogs, cats. Because we mustn't forget either that in Asia, cats, domesticated cats, are eaten, and that is now illegal as of the end of December. One of the things we've worked on in the last two five years is getting an animal welfare law brought into Thailand, and that was achieved at the end of December when it was passed. We're now working on, in effect, putting the the meat on the bones, if you like, of the law, because it's uh, it's one thing to say it's illegal to be cruel to animals, but you have to define that. But yet, it is illegal now to eat dogs or cats in Thailand. It was illegal before the actual trade in moving dogs to Vietnam, based on disease transmission, and in effect, that's how we were able to stop, significantly reduce anyway, the trade of dogs from Thailand to Vietnam. We believe the trade now, compared with the half a million of a few years ago, is now down certainly less than 20% of that. That was because we held conferences with partner organisations, including the Humane Society from the US, Animals Asia in Vietnam, and Change for Animals Foundation, and we formed an alliance. And we uh, hosted conferences in Hanoi with the governments of uh, Vietnam, Thailand. Laos and Cambodia, and then had a follow-up one with the same people in Bangkok. And this was not based on cruelty. I have to say that this was based entirely on disease control, because we knew that the Vietnamese government wouldn't would not care about to, that. Wouldn't really care about cruelty, yeah. and to go to them and say, "Well, you shouldn't be allowing this to happen because it's cruel," it was not going to work. But I remember actually saying to them, because they were, the Vietnamese were resistant, but actually saying to them, "Look." You, as a country, have, with all the other countries in the Southeast Asian Nations uh, Association, pledged to eliminate rabies by 2020. And stopping this trade of thousands and thousands of unvaccinated dogs of unknown origin, and some of them carrying rabies, some of them carrying rabies, as tests have shown, is not going to eliminate rabies in Vietnam. But I can get 100% guarantee you, whatever you allow this trade to continue, you will never limit, eliminate rabies. And in effect, that put them in a position where they would have looked rather stupid to have said, "Well, we couldn't care less about." So you that. basically boxed them in. In a way, yeah. And through their own, through those yeah. regulations, you were able to yeah. stop something else. And the Vietnamese government then, as a result, imposed a five-year initially ban on the import of dogs from outside Vietnam. I have to say that has not impacted the industry in Vietnam. It just means more Vietnamese dogs are getting stolen and used. But it, you know, it stopped that trade. That's why now, in reality, we're just starting soy dog in Vietnam because you know it's not right, in my view. It's okay, we stop the Thai dogs going, and then it doesn't matter about but the Vietnam dogs. more Viet. You know, I mean, there's estimated between five and seven million dogs a year consumed in Vietnam, and estimated. What's that number in China? Oh, that could be. No one knows the true figures. I mean, it's believed in China could be 20 to 30 million, and in Asia as a whole, 30 to 50 million. But nobody really knows the total figure because there's no, you know, you could probably get figures for the amount of beef consumed and everything because it's all legal. Goes it's not regulated, so we can't it's find not it. regulated. Yeah. What we do know is that both in China and Vietnam, from research we've done and others have done, that it looks now approximately 70 percent of the dogs in those countries are stolen pets and you know a lot of people think oh these are just stray dogs that nobody wants so these are purebred dogs 70 percent are stolen in china, in china in the in the trucks that are intercepted there you can see a huge number of them are actually german shepherds golden retrievers labradors this sort of dog and they are stolen and you know this is what a lot of people don't realize and in vietnam it's not a criminal offence to steal something under a certain value, it's a couple hundred dollars. So these young lads who go around stealing these dogs, they generally electrocute or poison them to get them, 
they can do that almost with impunity. No repercussion at all. Well, there is, but I'll come to that in a minute, because there's no legal repercussions for them. And generally, so they're stealing a dog. Dog in Vietnam, a good-sized dog, fetch $100. So, and that fuels off, often drug habits and whatever. Whereas if they were dealing with drugs, they face a death sentence if they're caught. So you work out the odds. Oh, you know. my gosh. But what is happening in Vietnam, there's been numerous cases, happening all the time now, is that villagers in central Vietnam and southern Vietnam are getting fed up of this and they're actually taking the law into their own hands. And while I'm not advocating this, there have even been cases of these people being killed, you know, literally beaten to death when they've been caught, and others get severe beatings to put them off. And this is becoming quite a phenomenon now in Vietnam. Wow. So there are some big dog loggers in Vietnam oh, yes, and all, yeah. Over, yeah. all over Asia. All over Asia. I mean, bear in mind, China, it's restricted actually predominantly to the three southern provinces and one in which border Vietnam, uh, you know, coincidentally or not, and also one in the northeast which borders North Korea. Yes, you will find dog meat restaurants in Beijing or other places, but these will be servicing more mainly people who have moved from those areas. And as these people move, so they bring the habit with them. In Vietnam, during, if you go back to the war years, there's no records of dog meat restaurants in Saigon, and no records at all really in central Vietnam and southern Vietnam of dog being eaten. Certainly in the north, certain hill tribes, it was their culture, and we believe Chinese military advisors also brought in, you know, made it more popular. And in times of famine, let's face it, people will eat anything. But it's from the, it grew in North Vietnam, and then after reunification, as North Vietnamese spread throughout uh, Vietnam in government positions, so the, the habit was introduced further afield. Amazing. I just can't believe all you're doing. But it's not just about the meat trade. You also are doing a lot of sterilization here. I mean, I, I've been walking around your facility and seeing many dogs being sterilized just today, and you're, you're building a new hospital to also do a, a lot of sterilization. Jill, can you tell us a little bit about how, how, how that started and, and your success that you have found so far? Yeah, sure. Um, when we first started Soy Dog, that was our main aim. The three of us, as John said, there were three of us, uh, we used to pick up dogs ourselves for sterilizing. We worked with two local vets who very kindly did sterilize the animals for us at cost price. We occasionally had visiting volunteer vets coming from overseas, and that's how it started very slowly, and we used our own money to fund that. Um, obviously, that was not sustainable. And later on, after the tsunami hit, we got a two-year grant from Whisper, and that was enabled us to move on and expand our sterilization program. It's paramount that this continues. Phuket is now under control. In the last 12 years, we've now just sterilized over 90,000 animals, cats as well as dogs, but predominantly dogs. Phuket, as I say, is now under control, just a maintenance program. We have now started to move off island into the local provinces where at the moment the team is sterilizing about 1,200 dogs per month. We've also got a small clinic in Bangkok who sterilize on a daily basis, and we're looking to start a huge program there, which will take several years to complete, but employing probably another 50 staff to start mass sterilization there. So, yeah, it's pretty busy. We do do sterilizations here Monday to Friday, the new hospital is not for sterilizations, that's purely for treatment. We have many dogs that come in who are road, uh, road accidents, they've got skin issues, they've got uh, TVT, cancer tumors, uh, many different kinds of diseases uh, that we need to, to treat here. They've got nobody else uh, to treat them, so we treat them wherever possible. They go back to the street, unless they're in danger, then we keep them here. Cruelty cases, cruelty for example. Cruelty cases, we would be. never ever put a cruelty case back on the street. But the, the idea is sterilize and get them back into the environment yeah, they were before. Yeah, because Mother Nature abhors a void. You start removing animals from the street that are vaccinated, that are sterilized, then other animals will move in and take I their see. place. And then you've got probably again unsterilized, unvaccinated dogs because there's a food source. So it's vital that these sterilized and vaccinated animals remain on the street 
um, to as help. You know, Chris. Yeah, sorry. As you know, you know, being a dog behaviour, dogs are territorial by nature, sure. and they will guard their area. So, in fact, we're trying to get a cartoon done now for education purposes that shows if you go into an area and you sterilise all the dogs, and the next area, more or less, showing dogs want you to come into there, but not sterilised, they will be kept out because dogs protect their food source. So. If you then come in and remove those dogs, which does happen on occasion, the local authority will get a complaint, they'll just remove them. Then other dogs that you've not had a chance to sterilise yet move in and you're then going to their previous area, but and they behind your dominant, back... And they start to breed and yeah, they right. create more yeah, packs. Right. Behind your back, some have now moved into that area and you've got the same, within months, you've probably got a bigger problem than you had, had before. before. I see. Um, yeah. So it's trying to come... But it's trying to get over to local authorities and even local businesses yeah so you've got this situation where okay local authorities and businesses just see stray dogs as a nuisance but they don't understand that if a dog Phuket is now Thailand's first rabies free province because all these dogs we sterilize against rabies thanks to the two of you well not but our team and your your volunteers right and our supporters bear in mind we can't do anything without without your support yeah. yeah yeah We're going to talk about that in a second. Yeah. So you've got this situation where if you then, people, oh, they're a nuisance. We don't want them here. You quite often get, for example, a new hotel manager will come in from the West, probably been working in Europe, never seen any stray dogs on the property or get rid of them. You know, what he doesn't realise is, is that the garbage problems here and everything else and guest feeding, those dogs are probably very friendly. They're used to tourists. They're, they're sterilised. They're vaccinated. They're keeping other dogs out. I had a case years ago where a new manager did this and literally within three months he had double the number of dogs that were not friendly were having puppies and whatever and he's screaming to oh can you come and do something about this you know so it's educating people though that people sure. don't really understand that if you get all the dogs you know you get 80 percent which is our aim here minimum 80 percent of dogs sterilized in an area you will see a reduction you go around if you'd have been here 12 years ago and now drive around Phuket, you will see a phenomenal difference. Not only will you see far less dogs on the street, but you'll also see the ones that are there are in far better condition. Yes, we still get horrendous cases, but they're the, the minority as opposed to the majority. So people are happy. They don't have this huge stray dog problem. Tourists are happier. They don't have to see dogs in horrendous condition, which they find upsetting. And... It's okay, still be an eye opener coming to Thailand if you're used to only living in uh, or visiting a Western country, but it's vastly changed from what it used to be. You know, Jill, this is uh, you doing dog rescue has really been trying. I mean, it's, it, it's actually you got injured and, and sick from actually rescuing dogs. Tell me a little bit what happened. Yeah, sure. I blow darted a dog, and what that basically means is dogs that are not easy to pick up, we chemically blow dart them with an anaesthetic. Yeah. So when the needle goes in, it, the dog jumps up and runs away. And what happened was this dog ran into a, a water buffalo field at the height of the rainy season, which had about 18 inches of water in it. And I knew that if I didn't go in after her, when the anaesthetic took hold, she would have gone under the water and drowned and died. Um, so I just ran in after her, I got to her just as she was going under the water, I uh, dragged her out to my truck which was a fair way and she was quite a big girl so I was exhausted by the time I got out, uh, took her to the clinic and she got sterilised and got taken back and I thought no more about it. A few days later I started feeling unwell and uh, the day after that I had said to John you're going to have to take me to hospital. The pain in my legs was excruciating, I can't describe. And uh, he took me to the hospital, we put me on a trolley in emergency and we just watched my legs change colour from normal flesh to a bluey grey colour. So gangrene? Yeah, septicemia. I don't remember anything from that moment on for, for another five weeks. John was told that uh, I was expected to die. If I did survive, then in all likelihood I would uh, lose both my arms and legs. Uh, The reality at the end of it was I only lost my legs. Um, So you lost both your legs? Both both legs, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that was that. And I came out of hospital two days before Christmas. And being the mad Brit that I am, I cooked uh, Christmas dinner for 12 people out of my wheelchair two days later. (laughs) 
and then on the Boxing Day we got news that the Asian tsunami had hit. Oh. And my best friend, Leone, was killed in the second wave. So... And was she one of your volunteers? She was one of our volunteers. Uh, she covered the south of the island. She fed hundreds of dogs down there and was involved in sterilization programs down there with us. So from basically the Boxing Day before my dear dad died, then I lost my legs, oh my and then my best friend died in the tsunami. That kind of, um, yeah, was not a very particularly good year. No, I can't imagine, but um, I will tell you one thing. I had no idea that you had lost your legs. You were walking with both your prosthetics. And as I'm walking around and you're touring me around your facility, you are doing quite amazing with two prosthetics. So I would never have known well, that. It's, it's 10 years ago now. Yeah, and so you're uh, used to it. I'm getting used to it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the one thing that kind of helped me through all this in a bizarre way, I, I, maybe things happen for a reason, I don't know. But because there were no relief teams here at the time, and the worst hit areas were just off island in Kaolak, and there were hundreds and thousands of, of bodies. Um, it was just absolutely appealing. Oh and gosh, so, you guys both lived through that. So John mm. and four of the gentlemen and myself went up to Cowlack. The guys were wrapping bodies, and I, John, took me to the local hospital where I was just basically counselling people. Just they just wanted to tell their story, have somebody to cry shoulder to cry on, to have a cuddle. And so we did that until the relief teams arrived. We then came back to Phuket. I carried on at the hospital in Phuket till all the uh, people had gone. OK, I don't know what it's like to go through a tsunami, as in the actual event, but I do know what it's like to go through a life-changing trauma, albeit only a few weeks before. Oh, my gosh. Um, and there you are counselling and helping people. So, you, you know, this is the kind of people that you guys are. You're just givers. You're give, give, give. It's amazing. Well must feel good somehow. It's, it's feeding your soul somehow. You see, see, people quite often say to us, what, what, why do you do this? You don't take a salary. Are you mad? You know, you, why do you do it? I don't get it. And what they don't get is that they're the losers because we're the richest people in the planet because our hearts are so full of the love we get back from these animals and, and the joy of knowing you've helped something, be it a dog or a human or a cat, whatever, just putting something back makes you the richest person on the planet. No money can buy that. No money, nothing else can give you that feeling. And on that note, we're going to go on to our sponsors and I'm going to, we're going to hear something great about some of the products out there that maybe can help raise awareness for your foundation. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back. Right after we kibble a little with our sponsors. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite for life. Pick up two tubes of Doggo Suds. Get the third tube free. Peppermint, tea tree, lavender, Doggo Sud shampoo. Made with all-natural coconut, jojoba, aloe. Great for healthy skin and soft, shiny coats. But no itchy, harsh chemicals. Lather up, rinse away. Try Doggo Suds. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio. dot com. I want to ask you a question. I had a colleague years ago said to me that street dogs were some of the happiest dogs on the, on the planet. That street dogs don't need many of them don't need to be saved. What are we saving them from? We take them off the street and we stick them into apartments and we lock the door. And now we've taken a dog that it was free and we've now basically made them into a prisoner in our apartment. What do you think about that? I think that's a very valid comment. We get sometimes on comments uh, on Facebook, say, how can you return that? You know, surely you don't return these dogs. I mean, what you're talking about here is thousands of dogs a year now. We're sterilizing, you know, last year's 30,000 dogs. I mean, we talked about 90,000 over 12 years in the last three years more than half of those in the last three years as we've grown where you know what you're talking about you know we would need a shelter the size of Phuket to keep these dogs but would the dogs be happy 
I can show you beach dogs or whatever living on the beach. And okay, you can say there is a danger of somebody maybe poisoning them or whatever. But those dogs are living happy. Bring them into a shelter situation where they're going to be contained. They're, they're going to be, be miserable. They're going to be cruel. miserable. In my opinion, it it's is cruel. cruel yes. Unless you are doing yeah. it for a reason whereby somebody has tried to kill the dog. Like we get machete attacks. Dogs being or the dog's been injured. In in that case, you bring the dog in, and, and, and he can't fend for himself on the street. If it, if the dog is deemed not to be able to fend for itself on the street, or if it's a human cruelty attack, you know, you cannot put a dog back that somebody's tried to kill because they're just going to try and kill it again. Yes. Okay. So those kind of dogs yeah. we keep. Dogs with amputations. This kind of thing. Blind dogs. Deaf dog. We we keep all these dogs because. We can't return them to the streets because it's wrong environment for them. But dogs that are the, happy on the, the street. Dogs, leave them there. Leave them. I am agreeing. They are but so, sterilize them. Sterilize, sterilize them, them so they're not reproducing. Vaccinate them. They are so much happier living free on the streets. It's a bit like saying, oh, uh, would you like to carry on living your normal life, going round and about and doing your thing? And yes, there's a little bit of risk in all life. We could all have a car accident tomorrow or we'll trip and break our legs or whatever or would you like to be locked in a room for the rest of your life to me it's no different so basically what you're saying is is that you guys want to be when you're reincarnated you want to come back as a as a dog in Paquette that's been sterilized by a story. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be okay, right? Yeah, you can yeah, right. finally finish out your retirement, John. Yeah. You'll also get, I mean, you just saw now as we were walking past uh, tr pulling up with a cage with eight puppies in it or something, six, six, seven, six puppies. Seven, seven, seven. That had just been picked up at our mobile clinic brought back from um, Pangnar province. The mother had been poisoned. Now, these puppies are looked about five, six weeks old. Yeah, about five weeks, I think. Yeah. yeah. And... Obviously, those puppies are not going to survive on their own, so they have to come here. And, and those dogs are going to need a home. And they're going to need a home. And that's always the object. Every dog that comes here, the object is to try and rehome them. And the fact is, people think, again, 90% of these dogs make fantastic pets. And these puppies, though, you know, you couldn't leave them there. And obviously, when they're grown older, we can't then just pick them up and say, OK, you go back to where we picked you up from, because that's strange. They don't know where they are. So that's sort of this sort of situation, they, they have to stay as well. But well, the object is to be home. Yeah, it's, I think it's fabulous. I, I cannot believe the amount of volunteers. How many volunteers do you have, Jill? Oh, it varies week to week, day to day even. We have two types. Um, the long-term volunteers who come here for two weeks plus. Uh, we get day trippers coming. We also get people just coming for a few days. And what's quite common is that people will come the soy dog and say oh next week i'm going up to chiang mai the week after that i'm going to lao they end up not leaving soy dog and they stay here for the full length of time that they're in thailand we have many many repeat uh, uh, volunteers who come back again and again and again so volunteers from the states from europe from all other over the world. all over the world all over the world and how does someone if someone wanted to volunteer how would they go about doing that well obviously you know, they have to, the flight, they... And they've got to get themselves here. They've got to get themselves here, sort themselves out some accommodation. We're in the north of the island. If you stay in a reasonable distance, uh, which we can give you the information on, uh, near the shelter, we can pick you up and take you back every day. Uh, we can order lunch for you, this kind of thing. That's wonderful. Um, so that's taken care of. But if they just, anybody's interested, they just email info at soydog.org and they'll be sent some information. Info at soydog.org. Dot org. Yeah. You know, I will tell you what was amazing is your socialization with these, these people are assigned to a group of dogs. Yeah. They are getting to know these dogs yeah. and this is actually helping socialize them. Correct. That helps them out to help be adopted. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. And um, and so it's it's so important mm -hmm. that these people do this. You know, you guys are doing an amazing feat. I don't know if you'll. It seems like such a huge undertaking. I don't know how you can really accomplish it all without support from other people. Tell me a little bit about how do we help you? How do we how do we get you what you need to continue this mission? Well, obviously, like any charity, I mean, I often say you can only do as much as the funds you raise. We like to think that we, you know, I mean, our Facebook page has well over a million followers. And I, I like to think that people support us because, if you like, they get what they see on the can. There's no money is going on this or 
somebody's expense account or whatever, the money is going to help animals. Yes, we have overheads, of course, any charity does. But all our people who are volunteering overseas to help us, they're all volunteers. We don't have paid staff. Yes, we have paid staff here, administrative staff. It'd be great if everybody was a volunteer, but that's not possible. You know, Jill and I are fortunate. Yeah, I have a pension, so I can, you know, we're self-sufficient. I don't need a salary. And, but uh, people do have to work to earn a living, and we've got some very good people here now, obviously besides uh, the Burmese and Thai shelter carers, our vets, uh, etc. But the, obviously as far as helping goes, I mean, volunteering is, is one thing, the main way is go to our website or Facebook page and, yeah, you know, you can sponsor a dog here. I mean, that's one of our big programs. Or you can sponsor our emergency response team. Or you can help dogs. You know, the dogs that have been rescued from the dog meat trade, we spent an awful lot of money on building new shelters for them in the north of Thailand because they were crowded, literally thousands of dogs were starving to death or dying from disease crammed into pounds and they'd literally gone from one hell into another and I couldn't allow it's one thing to organize rescuing these dogs couldn't sit back and let this happen you know it was ridiculous so again we fundraise we built these huge shelters in Buriram which is about four hours north of Bangkok it's not ideal but it's far better it's at least they've got room now they've got shelter but again we've had to build those shelters the government who department is, has a responsibility is the Department of Livestock. Dogs are not livestock. So they have no budget to care for these dogs. Oh so, again, we have to supply all the food, which is currently at the three shelters where there's two more shelters where there are fewer dogs but still there. Yeah, we order around about 30 tonnes of food every month. So, you know, we don't get any special deal on that. So it's that's to be paid for. And so people, again, can sponsor that. It's all on our website, the different programs. And, you know, I know it, it sounds all when you're talking about, talking about money, but the fact is, is that this doesn't happen. What you've seen today, the new hospital, these teams going out, all these vets sterilising, the teams going out getting the dogs, retrieving the dogs. I wish it was, could happen for free, but it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, you have, you have six, it does, and you have six veterinarians that are, that are working here. Full-time yeah. here, full -time. we've got two full-time in Bangkok, and we've got another three now under training for the new program in Bangkok. And, so we're talking also, to, uh, and we have volunteer foreign There's vets. also another two subcontract vets that work at the mobile yeah. uh, alternate days. Or alternate weeks now at the moment. Oh, alternate so, weeks. Yeah. 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 Well, I will tell you, I, I just think it's amazing what you guys have been doing, and I really want to... I'm going to try to help you as well. You know, We're going to get you some doggone smart pet products that help you out and if I and people that listen to my show a lot of you are in the pet industry I'm going to ask you to to look at soy dog and see whether you can help them out because they they need as much support as we can give them they are doing an amazing job here in Thailand and we're just so I'm so fortunate to be able to walk around today and to see this amazing vet hospital and this facility and see the dedication of your of your staff and of the volunteers it really is quite impressive and amazing I did not expect I'll be honest to see what I saw today. And I did not expect to hear about what's going on with the meat trade. I had no idea it was as large as it is. And the work that you guys are doing is wonderful. So I thank you for that. We all thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Grace. you for coming. And okay. Thank you for coming and uh, really, really appreciate your offer. And if any of your readers have got anything they can help us with, any donations will be gratefully received. Well, we're going to make sure that happens. <laughs> Listeners. Sorry, Listeners. Oh, and but they're also oh, got... Well, I have the blog as well, so thank you very much. Well, you might want to ask just one question. Sure. Probably a lot of people ask us, what does soy dog mean? Yeah, well, that's what I asked you, Joe. I said, what does what soy dog mean? Yeah, outside, but not in Paris. Not inside. Soy, soy is the Thai word for street or alley. Huh? So it literally translates as street dog or alley dog. So go visit www.soydog.org and check you guys out. And thanks a lot for having us here today. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.